Welcome back for the final time for day 15 of Starlighter Season 10 European Division coverage. It was worth the wait, ladies and gentlemen. We've got Team Taker versus Team Cloud9. Oh, it's going to be a good one. They just squared off in a best of two series in D2CL where Team Taker took it 2-0. to nil, And Cloud9 certainly hungry for some vengeance. This is only a best of one, but these teams have been squaring off against each other for the past few hours and uh, should have something interesting in store. I'm Zayori, joined again by Gods. Gods, what's up, man? Not too much. Looking forward to it. It's always fun to see teams like play these longer series. Sure, this is just the best of one, but as you said, they just played two games in D2CL, so this is kind of like an extension on that series. They'll be kind of adjusting and adapting to one another and have pretty good reads on what the two teams like to do. And this is the bigger bigger tournament. This is Starlighter, already up to over $200,000 in prize money. Most of that actually donated, well, not donated, but uh, from the, com the compendium sales uh, purchases. And it's it's great to see so uh, these two teams play both looking really good in the standings i think tinker only with one loss and cloud nine with two losses but six wins so both teams still with a very good shot at getting to the land finals in kiev yeah you're exactly right Dying cloud nine six and two team tinker six and one so uh, we talked about kind of the five front runners that are in the the top five positions right now navi tinker cloud nine secret and alliance only four teams can make it through so this is one of those big matches where a win here uh, will certainly bode well for the Ten standings later, uh, later on in the group stage. We saw some interesting plays in the last match. I sort Five of had it open remaining. as I was working on some other things, but uh, EGM played a Wisp and ended up picking up a Shadow Blade in the last match of all Reserve things. So that's time. sort of the, the talk of the town, at least on Twitter right now. Um, but Team Tinker been looking strong across the board. We'll see what they have in store here. Uh, Cloud9 have been running a lot of that Aoi 2000 Warlock. That's their uh, their big thing now, Dyer and with mixed pick. results. Uh, they've taken quite a few good games with it, but um, not a surefire thing. They also haven't been running much Void. It's never been a, a big pick of theirs. So we'll see how they look to run this. Great synergy, of course, with the Death Prophet, and this is more like an EG-style draft with the Death Prophet Void, but Tinker, don't seem faced by it. They've got Enigma, they've got Prophet, and a Troll Warlord. This is a hero that uh, the old team that PyCat was on with Misery used to used to pick quite a bit. They run the Troll, troll mid, known for kind of uh, using this hero in a very effective ways, and... He fights really nice and early, which I think is good against the Void. You, you can kind of take take the fights to the Void before he gets too much farm. Ten yeah, seconds, and they did nine. actually run the uh, Troll Warlord successfully in game one of that best of two series uh, seconds, that was nine. just on D2CL, and it was PyCat that played him. So you're certainly okay. right. A uh, couple things that Troll Reserve Warlord does time. very well. Uh, and the first one is Control Roche. Uh, they tend to run it more so when they're on the dire side, and if you get any kind of an opportunity, even just a stray pick off, you can move into the Roche pit and with a medallion or some other minus armor, uh, you can just flash, flash kill Roche in really a matter of seconds. Well, we're going to get a Fata Invoker out of this game as well, it looks like. So, some, uh, what kind of, oh, are we, are we getting that? This is, they've got Death Prophet already. So, actually, Death Prophet's most likely Fata's here. And this is going to be safe lane farming Invoker for maybe Envy. Envy has played Invoker in the past. Uh, a few games here and there, they never had much success with it. Uh, it wasn't like a... Remaining. Oh, Envy's the worst invoker ever. It was like a kind of 50-50 strat that didn't, seconds, was never convincing. Maybe they won a game here or there with it, but um, obviously Exor Invoker synergizes very nicely with the Chronosphere, having Sun Strikes, Chaos Meteors, and a lot of AoE damage, but it does mean Void is most likely going to the offlane. Yeah, and on the Radiant side, it works uh, a little bit remaining. better, something that you can get away with. Cloud Team Tinker, nine, they will two. certainly be commencing the push this game, gods. Yes. Holy Toledo, Enigma... Punish. Nature's Prophet and Jakiro. I feel Cloud9 have a lot of very level dependent heroes. Like Invoker takes a while to come online. Death Prophet at the early levels. Um, if you get the uncontested farm, it's a great hero, but not not the best necessarily at stopping some of this early aggression from Team Tinker and Void especially. Not good at fighting it. So Tinker with the with this draft of theirs, I think they're going to be looking to really get up in Cloud9's face and. I hope we get to see. It will be an offlane profit, and if you look at, I think the way the profit's being played lately is just constant ganking early on. None of this. It's less farming and split push based, and much Cloud more gank oriented. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we're seeing that hand of Midas pick up less and less on profit, where much more frequently we're seeing that null tally into blade mail build, and even just fast power treads uh, straight into a blink yeah. dagger, and then maelstrom is becoming a little bit more popular. You'll see early on the uh, teleports to other lanes and try and turn what would be an even exchange uh, 
into something tipping the scales in favor of the side that profits on. You mentioned Cloud9 being farm dependent, and uh, Sand King fits into that. With an Enigma pick, there might be a little bit of uh, a window for that um, Sand King to work the jungle and find steps towards a, a quick Blink Dagger. So that is uh, one one good thing here about this greedier Cloud9 roster is they'll have a little bit of space in the first 10 minutes or so, but Ten once Enigma seconds, grabs that mech, you can certainly expect him to move out of the jungle and get a little more active with pushing down Five towers and remain. perhaps yeah. even taking some team fights. And often that first push can even come before the mech. Like you hit level 5 and you go to the safe lane. If that's an offlane Void, Void can definitely not defend the push against a, a level 5 <laughs> Enigma, Jakira with yeah. even just 2 points in Liquid Fire and Whatever safe lane farmer they may be going for, and it seems with the TA ban that at least Cloud9 think Tinker may be picking up some kind of a mid running the troll as a safe laner for, for Pycat. Have, have they been running the... I mean, you said Pycat's been playing the trolls, he's been mid, safe lane. How I think it's been mostly mid. Seconds, the, okay. the games that I've seen have been mid, though. Um, room for flexibility. Yeah. I think Cloud9 are more mid. just afraid of the Roche control. Already Team Tinker have a pretty scary Roche lineup, and TA is just Cloud so nine. good on that department. But pick. perhaps it will be a safe lane troll mm -hmm. after all. There's the Magnus pick for Team Tinker. That's not uh, nothing I would have expected to come out as a last pick. I'm not opposed to it. It gives them some great, great team fight, and yeah, it's... <laughs> it's a hero we're seeing le definitely less and less of compared to a few years ago but uh, it's still sometimes picked Ten most notably of remaining. course for uh, S4 when it was still playing with Alliance and Arise is obviously the probably yeah. the next Actually, biggest Magnus player pulling up the stats here Team Tinker have no competitive games on history with Magnus Die so yeah, this is this is a first this is fun yeah. this is your AUI Warlock so we get a last pick Warlock yep. and I like the Warlock pick. It's potentially yep. something that can help you fight a push strat and hey, upheaval. Good spell. Yeah, upheaval's a good spell and also just uh, adds to that whole team fight synergy. They've got a very obvious five-man group here with your Exorcism, your Void, Envy's Invoker to drop some damage into it, and now they've got uh, the giant Golem to come raining down from the sky. And even Sand King on top of that can jump right into the Chrono and do some pretty serious damage with uh, that Epicenter. So both teams with a fair bit of team fight. Cloud9 they do have a, a fair bit of pushing power. If they take some team fights, they can certainly knock down some towers. But Team Tinker, if Cloud9 make any kind of a misstep Ten in that mid-game, you can be pretty much assured that objectives will be secured, whether it's Roche, whether it's towers. Uh, that is something that Team Tinker's lineup really will excel at. Yeah, something they can also also do, but no, they're not going to do it, is they've got great level 1 Roche and potential. You've got Prophet Enigma. You can make Edelons off the tree and Grab a point in Liquid Fire, but that's not going to be the case here. Prophet's TP'd straight into mid jungle, is going straight to do some blocking. This is reminiscent of what Ahaya would do in his Nature's Prophet back at TI3 when uh, RNG Sports did really well. He had a very different playstyle on Prophet to like Bulldog, who was obviously the, the big rat Dota king. And uh, Ahaya would TP, go TP level 1 straight into the enemy jungle and then uh, either go get level 2 from cliff jungling or just go bottom lane with teleport level 1 and just play very passively. So. We're seeing a similar thing here from uh, the Nature's Prophet of PyCat. Yeah, now Cloud9, they'll do an invade of their own. A good positioning from Team Tinker. They won't be caught too unaware. Uh, Bone7 looking for initiation, but Bobo will actually turn and throw an auto attack. Bone7's out by himself and needs to be a little careful here. Support for Team Tinker is inbound. And I don't think Tinker are too eager to take a level 1 skirmish here. Enigma not really that great in this scenario. Obviously wants to go Eidolon's level 1 and just doesn't contribute much before the neutrals come out. So it will end there. A couple of wards come down. A Radiant Sentry here to block the big camp. One in the tree line here to block this medium camp. And their pole camp will also get blocked by an Observer. So even though Cloud9 move into the jungle and don't find a skirmish, they will find the camps that they want to get blocked. And both sides will kind of cripple the jungle for one another. The battle yeah. Begins. Uh, definitely hurts Team Tinker more with the Enigma pick, unless Enigma can find some other camps. And Boba is going to start at least with the deny at bottom lane, and we'll see where he goes from here. Doesn't have sentry wards. Yeah, no dire sentry wards right now. So I think Bulba may just wait till he has 200 gold. He did see the sentry go down, so he's about 20 gold short of sentries, and he can just even wait at a fountain. It's is slowing him down by like maybe a minute as far as his jungle routine goes, but as far as Enigma's concerned, catch up is very quick. Yeah, definitely. Now on the dire side, it will be a safe lane troll warlord played by Sing Sing EGM here on the Jakiro. That means in the mid, it will be the Koikva Magnus, and in the off lane, Pycat will take helm on the Nature's Prophet. So switching it up a little bit, we've seen Pycat on the troll most of the time, but 
Here they'll do things just a little differently. Bulba will move into the jungle uh, on that Enigma, as we've already seen. Radiant side, offlane Faceless Void, played by Bone7. Fada will take solo mid on the Death Prophet, which makes a nice safe lane tri lane around Eternal Envy's Invoker. Pylai Dai here on the Sand King, and Aoi2000 on his signature Warlock already stacking and pulling in the jungle. Yeah. Neither team with the, any much ability to zone out offlaners. Like some of the games early today, we saw offlaners still level one at like five minutes of the game, but this is going to be very different case. Void at top. Only against a dual lane with tons of regen, he should be able to get experience at least in this lane uh, fairly easily. And Prophet at bottom, he can pull creep waves to himself with treants, use the treants for vision. He is up against more of a true tri lane, but I think even Pycat should do an okay job getting some experience. Yeah, and he does have uh, this key ward down right here to give him some insight into the jungle so he can do stuff just like this. Can test uh, the pole camps, find some stray last hits, and very least, leech some experience. But I'll need to be a little bit careful. Some strike will fly through off the mark, but Burrow Strike connects. Aoi 2000 here to follow up, has that point in Shadow Ward. Pycat looking to TP home, and he'll survive, but just barely. What a close call for the Prophet. <sighs> Miscommunication. Envy needed to wait for the stun. Maybe he thought, I think he thought Sanking was about to stun as he threw the Sunstrike, but uh, yeah, if they had the Sunstrike, that's, that's your first blood. Yeah, slightly better coordination, could have yielded a kill, but that's all right. No harm, no foul. Up top, Bone 7 will get initiated upon. They force out the time walk. Jakiro going for that first point in dual breath, and I'll be curious to see what build EGM goes for here. We've seen an array of different Jakiro builds. Uh, most of them built around liquid fire, but some Jakiros driving a value point in Ice Path, sometimes leveling it up all the way, and we've others, even seen others going for the dual breath primary. Scales very well in damage, but uh, also useful as just a level 1 value point with that 30% slow. But Bone7 yeah, yeah. taking a lot of harassment up here, and only two tangos left. Yeah, he's going to be forced maybe to use another time walk here, and as you say, low on tangos, and no, won't have to use the time walk, but he's more or less going to go back to base pretty soon. So he has got himself up to level 4, but this lane just gets harder and harder. So the experience is easy to get at the start, but now that the Jakiro as well as the uh, Troll have level 2, level 3, this lane's going to become nearly impossible to stay in. Yeah, and now Jakiro comes back in, another dual breath. They'll force out the uh, next time walk. Now the Void's low on mana, and I think that'll be Bone Seven's retreat. And he'll just hightail it back to the well, really no other choice here. Unless he wants to roll the dice and consider conceding a first blood. Yeah, he was so actually just trying to bait out the, the mana from Jakira there. He, he was already planning to go to heal, so he's like, okay, I'm going to make EGM use his last bit of mana here, so when I come back to the lane, I'll have a slightly easier time. Yeah, and that's a good read. Uh, EGM out of clarities now, so we'll be stuck on low mana for a little while. Uh, both uh, the Nature's Prophet and the Void, a comparable uh, experience here, both with 4 or 5 CS oh, under each other's belts, wrong. and... Uh, sitting level 3, Void actually finding a little bit more experience, but both offlaners struggling a fair bit. Let's check on the Enigma, see how he's doing. Bulba finding a little <laughs> bit of farm across these camps, but it's he's pretty slow for going. That, that D ward. It was actually a sentry which expired, but uh, he was trying to D ward this medium camp, which will now finally spawn. But uh, yeah. by now it's uh, long, uh, long past needing D warding. Fada double, uh, bottles up the double damage rune. They'll try to contest it, but he will make it back to safety. Now Bulba grabs his soul ring, though. So that is uh, definitely that first milestone for him. We'll soon be level four. Looking at the mid lanes, they're uh, almost level six, and that's your benchmark with the Enigma. Won't be able to keep up this game, but still recovers okay. Yeah. Uh, it's a similar kind of story for Pilot. Day. Not jungling all that fast. He is a Sand King, so he's not meant to be jungling anywhere near as fast as Enigma, but... Uh, level 3 now, hasn't really got many stacks for himself, can stack his big count now and farm it and that'll get him maybe level 4.5. We'll get him just, he's just got boots at the moment, but he can still get like a 10 minute blink dagger if he decides to not help his team and just farm jungle for the next little bit. I like what Pycat's doing, he's actually blocking some of these uh, big neutral camps from respawning using his trance. Yeah, and uh, the Sand King, you will find the stack here, and the, the key for Sand King jungling is you need that level 3. You need that second point in Standstorm to be able to do this, and he'll find a double stack here. And as you mentioned, find a baseline of farm and start working towards the Blink Dagger. This camp, very difficult for uh, Team Tinker to contest. Even with the tree ants, it's hard for them to make it all the way over there before uh, expiring. So he'll be safe for now, Pycat, just doing what he can to find experience. Stray last hits here and there, still only uh, 5 up on him. Position 1 yeah, is looking pretty even in farm as well. Envy uh, and Sing Sing both within a few last hits of each other. These, these, these sun strikes, Envy misses another one at bottom lane, and Pycat should be able to get himself to freedom back the T1 tower. And actually, going to play oh, it safe and just TP. TP. <laughs> yeah. 
I think he could have done it the old fashioned way, sense. but yeah, doesn't want to take any unnecessary risk. Yeah. It's slightly more efficient play because he can teleport home and then use the teleport skill to actually go out to lane. He's actually going for a gank. Oh no, just a push top lane. Yeah, but they will start chipping away at this tower. You mentioned that early pressure from uh, the Jakiro and only two points in liquid fire, but it really helps cut down this tower very quickly and that attack speed slow, making a big difference. Enigma makes some Eidolons and all of a sudden that pressure comes out. Tier 1 tower goes down and Cloud9 won't even glyph it. No defense mounted, they just let it fall. Bone 7 gets repelled once more. Uh, Fada rotating his way over, thinking about making something happen. Does have an Dying earlier point in exorcism than most DPs have been going for recently, uh, sitting at level 7. And looks like they will try to make Radiant a hold here at the tier 2. There's fortified. the glyph, and ooh, the wraparound from behind. Quick was here, Haystrun on. He's got an RP, will burn it solo onto Fada. Skewer back. Now Fada in big trouble. No way he'll survive that one. First blood is drawn. And now Team Tinker, they may be rewarded with a tier 2 tower in the first 7 minutes. Yeah, that was really it's nice movement from Quaker. Uh, Tink Tinker knew the only way Cloud9 could Radiant's defend the tier top 2 top tower was by bringing in the Death Prophet. Magnus Dyer's was ready for it, tracked him, RP pushed him in, and with that, tier 2 tower, tower is taken as well as probably the most important hero to be killed is taken out, the the Death Prophet. I think that's more a more high priority target than the Invoker at this point, so yep. things going really well here in the early game for Tinker as they pick up those towers. Yeah, we've Radiant's talked about Death Prophet being a hero attack. that is very susceptible to ganks and one that's a high priority because uh, she snowballs out of control if she's left unchecked and if you shut her down, her recovery mechanism is really not so strong. Uh, the Invoker stands to reason Envy will pick up a Hand of Midas. Pretty common stuff on your Exhort Invoker and he is pooling up his gold up to about 1700. Phase Boots already complete and will have a decently timed Midas. But now Fada gets slowed down that much more. Still has phase boots completed, so he has that baseline of farm. But still no exorcism coming out. We're about eight minutes in, and Cloud9 still haven't really been able to utilize that big ultimate. Yeah, it's why it's kind of why you often see exorcism not leveled until like level eight, level nine. Sometimes just because level one ultimate doesn't really you can't really solo push a tower, a full HP tower. Like you could use the full duration, and a full HP T1 tower usually survives with like three, four hundred HP. So. Often points in Exorcism are kind of used later for when you kind of group up with your team. But hey, he gets to one point, as you said, hasn't been used yet. So, I mean, he went top. He was going to die regardless of what skill that he has. But uh, maybe another point in the Witchcraft or Crypt Swarm earlier could have done him some more good. But he's now bottom lane. So it looks like he does want to use the Exorcism to get a, a counter tower here. And this, this tier 1 is already very low. So they probably don't even need the Exorcism for it. Yeah, Radiant's Eternal Envy's been doing a good job with his Forged Spirits, and only so much the Prophet can do to uh, delay the push. Piecat, only level 5, sitting on brown boots, double damage in the bottle of Fada. They won't need anything to bring this down, just the old-fashioned right-click, left-right, 1-2. Oh, you have to bring it down after uh, this glyph expires. Looks like they'll give the last hit uh, to Fada here. Or well, he'll pick it up. Hard to say if that was intentional or not, but he'll grab the bonus gold. And Envy should be pretty close to his Midas. Yeah, oh, he's got it already. So good timing for that. Meanwhile, in the mid lane, Team Tinker will group up and start pushing once more. Level 3 Liquid Fire on the Jakiro. This tower will fall. It's just a matter of will it get denied. Now Bone7 hops forward. He does have a Chronosphere available. EGM goes in. Once the last hit on the tower, will die for it, but secures it. Even Pylai Die uses the Epicenter to make that kill happen. Yeah, I, mean, I guess EGM will be quite happy with that. He's loves to get his farm up and sure he dies for it, but hey, he gets the tower. Does give Sankey enough money to get up his Blink Dagger, which is going to be crucial for defending some of these pushes coming in. And uh, if they want to have any chance of contesting Roshan, it's also a crucial item. But I, I, I think even with some of these items, with Void hitting level 6 now, Tinker should be able to get Roshan just whenever they please. And hey, they're going in now. They're not wasting any wow. time. Yeah, 10 minute Rosh. They've got the medallion up already. Jakiro's picked it. So this will be quite easy. Sing Sing hanging on to the battle transfer now. Radiant side do have a ward right here on the high ground. They'll even Sunstrike into the pit to uh, check the HP on Roche. They'll try to contest this, but it's already low, and Pylai die wishing he had that ultimate available right now. Koikva looking for the skewer into the pit. A noble effort, won't find it, but Roche does go down. It is Sing Sing to grab the Aegis. And that just furthers the Team Tinker lead that much more. Looking at the graph, already 4,000 gold in their favor. Yeah, he, there was there was no stopping that one. Uh, I think Cloud9 just were hoping they could maybe get in there, scare off Tinker. If they got there, when, if Tinker 1 is 5, often teams may get greedy and just try Roshan with like three of their heroes that can do it, and that's where you can capitalize. But the Sunstrike got them some vision, and hey, it was five heroes in there. There was no way that was going to work. And 
this is where Tinkers start to snowball. They're going to go for tower after tower. They've got two towers top, the tier one mid, and I think they're going to go for both towers at this bottom lane. The Vlad's on Sing Sing with an Aegis. Liquid Fire still just level three, but hey, that's going to be enough for the mech complete on Bulba, so their push is just really hard to stop. Yeah, oh, they will make a contest up in the top lane, though. Sing Sing, the first to TPN. Exorcism has already been deployed, and R RP on to Bone 7. Will they have the damage to bring him down before the Chrono? It's not enough. Now the Sunstrike will commence, and Koikba takes a lot of damage. First to fall, they'll also proc the Aegis. Sort of an odd hold from Team Tinker as they only commit two heroes for it, but now support's on the way in. EGM throws an Ice Path, will be off the mark as Sing Sing comes back to life. And the rest of Cloud9 will just TP out. Meanwhile, in the bottom lane, Team Tinker don't even make it to the tower. It's still completely unscathed. And it will just end as a two-for-nil trade, one of them being the Aegis. Well, we, we've talked about the value point in Backtrack. That was it kicking in. He backtracked that Shockwave. He still lived on about 300 HP, so uh, even if the Shockwave hit, it wouldn't have done enough damage to kill him off. But he would have been very, very close to dying. I think he even backtracked some other damage in there as well. So, Because he looked like he took no damage at all. Yep. Envy down bottom will get initiated upon. Black Hole from Bulba to secure the kill, and they'll have the right clicks to bring him down. A much-needed kill on the Invoker, but now can they make the escape? Upheaval coming out. Bulba slowed down to oblivion, and Aoi 2000 will continue the channel. That makes room for Pylai Die to come in. Burrow strikes on the mark, and Enigma will get punished as they make it a one-for-one one. Enigma for Invoker. Well, I, yeah, I, core hero for four position hero. Probably good for Team Tinker and also force the TP rotation, so they're the ones kind of controlling play for the most part still. Uh, and they won't endurance. be too happy about yeah, they won't be too happy about wasting the Aegis and giving up those two kills top, because they could have just traded the T1 and gotten the T2 bottom, I think, but tried to make use yeah. of the RP to take a fight and they just need to kind of settle down, remember what their objectives are and keep lanes pushed out while going for towers themselves. Yeah, I, I think they could have done better up top had they just committed more resources. They just simply didn't have enough heroes to deal with uh, the big push from Cloud9. Especially with the Exorcism on, the Chronosphere available, there was really just uh, just no hope. But that's alright, they'll still hang on to a decent lead here. And uh, Drum of Endurance now picked up on Sing Sing's Troll Warlord. So he's definitely starting to come online a bit more and earn now on EGM's Jakiro. So he's got his core items coming up. Koikba just looking for opportunities to perhaps initiate on someone. He's just going to clear up the creep wave down bottom and continue looking for farm himself. Going to get the graphs again. Experience is leveled out, but Cloud9 uh, pretty far behind in terms of gold, mostly because of that tower counter. It is 4 to 1 already in Lost Towers. Yeah, Cloud9 do have this big, scary team fight, though. That's the one thing we haven't seen come into play just yet. Chronosphere, the Infernal or Chaotic Offering, the Sand King Epicenter, and the Death Prophet Ultimate. If you can combine these spells and they're only going to get more potent. Around the time where Cloud9 start having heroes hit level 11, get your level 2 ultis coming into play, that's where they can really start Dyer's making a stand. Eternal Envy down bottom will get caught by the RP. Yeah. Just a solo one coming out from Koikva, but there's the Owie 2000 Warlock Ultimate. Out comes the Chronosphere as well as the Epicenter Team Tinker in big trouble. We'll finally get a taste of this team fight prowess. They'll trade their Invoker for this fight, and they'll also lose their Sand King in the mix, but now Fada comes in, cleans it up, and ends as a two for three trade. But it takes all five heroes of Cloud9 to make it happen. The rest of Team Tinker, Sing Sing, and PyCat in the mid lane, force out the Glyph and do decent damage to this tier 2 tower. Yeah, entire Cloud9 team as well as all of their big ultimates, but still a favorable trade. So that's the kind of fight they just have to take at this point. They're going to actually force a buyback. The wow, Sing Sing will get caught. The buyback proves worth it from Pylai Dai as they get another counter kill. And he's only level 8, so. Good. Yeah, pretty cheap buyback. Only 400 gold. And they keep the tower alive. So yeah, Cloud9. You're killing a very influential Tinker hero. So, that'll help level things out, and Cloud9 will regain a little bit of momentum here. Aoi 2000 picks up a Blink Dagger mm. as his first big item on the Warlock. I, I haven't actually, I mean, I've, I've sort of seen some drafts and bits of play here and there from the AOI Warlock, but I don't know if he normally goes for this Blink Dagger. I don't think Correct so. Correct me if I'm wrong if you've seen games of this, but I have not seen him go for a straight Blink Rush. Maybe, it's, maybe it, has been, it has been done by him, but it's, it's new for me. Yeah, the, the few games uh, of Star Ladder I've covered where he's picked Warlock, he has not rushed a Blink Dagger. And my next thought is, well, what did he get instead? And uh, I'm kind of drawing a blank here. But uh, I mean, uh, probably just like you go Ag Scepter for the team. Uh, is yeah, the, more, yeah, more uh, like a, an Ag's one? Refresher style build. I think I've seen him go four staff kind of mobility items, but the Blink first is 
rather it's... interesting. I guess to get in position for those good upheavals, you can hop yes. into the tree line and upheaval in a team fight where they can't really find you. Sort of a similar, similar thought process to like the uh, the blink dagger sniper or something. But... And because you're not attacking them, they actually don't get vision of you. So you could you could be doing this tremendous slow to the entire enemy team from fog or like in some trees where they can't find you, can't disable you, and they they just get no vision. So the item yeah. definitely makes a lot of sense and. I think it's a pretty cool pickup here. Like it, it's, it should. will be interesting to see how it works out in, in the team fights. But I mean, upheaval alone doesn't win you a team fight. It's a, it's an incredible slow, the best slow in the game. But you've got to have the damage to back it up and get the good initiations. Yeah, well, certainly synergizes well with uh, the exorcism, which has been deployed. It secures the top tier one tower. Bone Seven will stick around and grab the last hit. Fada had to TP mid to defend the tier two tower. And he will be successful on uh, that, that adventure there. Team Tanker get attack. repelled, and they will start to group up in the Radiant Jungle, looking at Radiant Vision. They don't have much in the way of map control right now. They've got one ward down outside of their Ancients, but their jungle is completely dark, and Team Tinker will try to use this to their advantage. We see over the side of the tree line, Koikba does have an Invisibility Rune on. Blink Dagger at the ready. There's your RP on two. Skewer back right into the Ice Path, but Owie 2000 there with the Golem. That'll help break things up. Bone 7 to follow up. Sing Sing will take a Sun Strike to the face. The Meatball flying through. Team Tinker will survive the initial Onslaught by grabbing two kills of their own, and they'll be okay with this trade. They also get the Golem, a nice 100 gold bounty going their way, only losing Sing Sing. Yeah, I mean, you can see there, like, that's that's the big upheaval, but they just didn't have the damage they needed. They even got the, the kind of perfect timing coming out from the Infernal the infernal Initiation with the upheaval to follow, but Death Prophet died too fast, and as soon as Death Prophet's dead, that means you're knocking the... Well, the Exorcism was on cooldown anyways, and then the Sanking didn't get any chance to Epicenter. Yeah, that's... That was my gonna be my next point. I feel like Cloud9 just can't fight without the Death Prophet ultimate available. That's such a key part of their damage. He's also level 12, so level 2 exorcism is so potent at this stage of the game. And of course, they weren't quite ready to take the fight the way that they did. Koikva started it off with that invisibility rune, so... To be fair, Cloud9 didn't really want to take a full-out uh, engage right there, but uh, they were kind of forced as Koikva had a nice initiation. Wonder what PyCat is storing up all this gold for. He did go for the early hand of Midas, and he's up to 4,500 gold. Still hasn't spent a oh dime no. of it. Maybe just a Necro 3 rush? I, it's... I mean, you could just... Obviously, you, in theory, should just be buying the Necro 2 right now. Uh, but 5.2k gold, he can get the, the Necro 3. Would be a straight-up purchase. And I think Necro 3, just to help bring down the towers, also does, theoretically, a lot of damage to whoever kills the, uh, the blue Necro, so... Mm -hmm. uh, there's a lot with all the AOE damage. Someone's going to be killing that Necro, which is in general. I mean, it does some good damage. Yeah, there we go. He picks up the Necro. Oh, that's Invoker's Necro. Yep. I can't still on the side. Yeah, Invoker mm. gets a level two Necro book. He may just go into the the kind of more standard Rat Dota style of just a Blink Dagger and Quick Maelstrom, and he's pretty close to being able to just click up uh, yeah. both of them real fast here. Team Tinker will once again secure the second Rosh. 19 minutes in, and uh, so this time. It goes to PyCat this time, and oh, Scythe of Ice Rush. Is under okay. You don't see that build too often. Yeah, it's... They're not up against... I mean, normally your Hex, like, especially Hex, Hex Rush is more up against your true carries, but... It'll help if you can get it on the Void before he Chronos, get it on, like, someone like the Sand King to disable and lock him down. Yep. Top tier one tower goes down before this fight really breaks out. Fada still has a fair bit of duration on his ultimate. Now Bone 7 hops in. Fada in full retreat. Sing Sing on the other side. And uh, Koikba cancel casting the RP but won't be able to get it off. They'll lose their Jakiro and get a counter kill on the Sand King. Is Sing Sing doing a great job just zoning out the rest of Cloud9 as the Chronosphere came out. Now Envy will get left behind. He could potentially look for a Ghost Walk here, but nope, there's the Black Hole. That'll lock him in place, and even the Golem will get pulled towards the center of the hole, and another nice 100 gold bounty going the way of Team Tinker. A noble Ooh, effort from Owie 2000. Bone seven. <laughs> uh -oh. and he's playing yeah, he's, Ring Around to Rosie with Koikva here. He's in some trouble. Looks like his TP got uh, canceled. A little bit too speedy with that Mask of Madness, but it's pretty soon to expire. Koikva has his Blink Dagger up, and yeah, we'll just chop him down. That's a nice streak going the way of Koikva. 400 gold, and a good team fight for Team Tinker. They lose their Tier 2 tower, but take a good skirmish. Yeah, they, get, they get some important kills. They, they weren't really in position to defend it because they uh, spent the time to bring down Roshan just previously, so they weren't quite in position, keeping lanes pushed out. Like, you go for Roshan, you kind of lose some of that creep equilibrium, but... 
the benefit is they now have an Aegis, and they're in a position to Radiance take this last out of tower and look to try and seal the deal. By no means is this uh, the crazy lead they've got, but it's it's getting up to about 8,000 gold with all the Radiance towers they've got in 20 tower minutes. That's fallen. It's pretty impressive, but um, you look at their side of the map, there's three out of towers still remaining, so if Cloud9 do win a fight or two, most towers are just kind of money bags waiting to be collected by the Cloud9 lineup. Yeah, Team Tinker do have a decent experience advantage, advantage about 8,000, uh, pretty comparable to their gold lead to boot. Now, the Troll Warlord working on a BKB, not too far off the mark. Pycat already with 2,000 gold in savings following that Scythe of Ice that he picked up. And Bulba, he'll just go straight for a BKB. Still has to worry about that Warlock ultimate to cut through it and interrupt his ulti, but uh, as long as he catches the Warlock inside of the Black Hole where they pick him off first, that BKB will prove very effective here in terms of the silence and really just all that magic damage that Cloud9 have to uh, to bring him down. Yeah. I think that's yeah, maybe the, probably the one thing that Tinker are kind of waiting for before they maybe uh, take their next big engagement or try and push. I, I think even pushing higher ground though is a bit of a give me a tough thought. They have they have got good push with the Liquid Fire, of course, but uh, trying to go high ground into fog against these big ultimates is just kind of a a problematic situation yeah, for them. They they basically have to take a fight outside of the base or at least burn a few of these ultimates. Maybe not all of them, but uh, if maybe like two of the four are stuck on cooldown, then they may have a, a better chance at uh, reaching that tier three. It's actually Wall. Cloud9 pushing right now. They're the ones, even up against Aegis, still going on the aggressive here. And it's because of how big these ultimates are. Smoke from the Enigma is going to get revealed instantly, but now they know exactly where these heroes are. Oh, yeah, Cloud9. They'll break the tree line. Highlight die gets caught. Sand King will fall before he can get off the ulti. The tower will stay standing with plenty of hit points to spare. Bone 7 gets caught by an RP, and they'll bring him down before the chrono can be deployed. Fada will get off the exorcism, but to what avail? He's already lost two of his teammates. They'll both buy back. In comes the ultimate from the Warlock. That'll stuck uh, EGM in his place. Sing Sing slow to an oblivion by the upheaval. Now the, the counter kill has come about as Sand King gets off his ultimate. The Enigma will fall. Triple kill for Pycat, though. As uh, now, the uh, Magnus is on the run, and that will be the Aegis and their Magnus. So Cloud9, they take a big team fight. It costs them two buybacks, but they make it happen. Off to the side, Pycat mm -hmm. comes back from the Aegis, will get caught inside of the Chrono, throws out a Hex, and... Nope, the Silence is there, and that'll interrupt his teleport. He got an Ultra Kill on that fight, I think Pycat in the end. He got all four of those kills that Team Tinker got, but the buybacks were just paying for themselves there. Cloud9 didn't hesitate. They didn't even have a T2 tower to TP to. They fought back when there was nothing to TP to, just made the long walk from base, and they get back in and make up for what was a really bad start to that team fight. Yeah. Now EGM will get initiated on, but able to force staff back to safety. Bone 7 gets left behind, and they might be able to grab another kill here. This will end up being a dieback for him if he gets picked off. Does have the time walk, but the ice path is there. He'll time walk to safety for now, but the auto attacks will chase him down. And that'll be pretty costly for the Void, despite it being a uh, successful team fight. More importantly, Team Tinker t uh, keep their Tier 2 tower in the mid lane still standing. Oh, wow. Yeah. Now we're all tied up 14 apiece. Team Tinker still with a decent gold lead. Experience starting to level out a little bit, but Cloud9 showing us that all it takes is a good series of ultimates, and despite being down a decent gold margin, they can still bring the fight to Team Tinker. Yeah, you can see from the, the net worth grab that that fight did favor Cloud9. Even with the buybacks, they still ended up gaining gold on their core heroes and taken away from Team Tinker, so... Oh, and be down bottom solo take. RP from Koikba. In comes Pycat. There's the Hex, and that's basically a free kill on the Tinker. You don't normally think of solo RPs as a, a good use of the cooldown, but when you're taking down the farming invoker, it's certainly worth it. Yeah, he's... I, I like how Koikba's been playing. He's not sitting back, waiting too long, trying to get those three to five man RPs. Last fight, it was a solo RP on the Void. He'll use it for a solo picker for Envy. He's happy just to use this cooldown much more liberate, kind of like how you see Faceless Voids use Chronosphere. But like if you're getting a solo kill on a key hero, it's it's worth it. And that's what Quick has done with his last two RPs. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. And now Tinker will just clear out the Radiant Jungle before they make their retreat. Pycat has picked up a Maelstrom as his next item following the Scythe of Ice. And already has some more gold to his name. Oh, the TP down bottom finds Bone 7, starts it off with a Hex. Will they be able to get in here in time to lock him down? Nope. Hero I, I think just a Bobo was trying to go for a black hole there. Like, if the only way that Malifus wasn't going to cut it, if they want that kill, they had to get in range for a black hole. And it looks like Bobo was 
maybe willing to commit it. Not just RPs, but they're using black holes for solo kills if they can. Yeah, maybe a Malefice into Ice Path would have been enough, but now Pylai die smoked up, will catch Pycat with a stun. The uh, Sunstrike is on the mark, but oh, the Golem, it's a complete whiff. Bobo will pop his BKB after it comes down. Pycat was caught in the Yules, and he'll be able to survive. Aoi 2000 goes down to the Wrath of Nature from the Nature's Prophet, despite the Chrono coming out. Bone 7 taking a lot of damage, will still fall to the Jakiro. Sand King with the ultimate will be off the mark, and it's already a one for two trade. Make it a two for two as they lose their Jakiro, but in comes uh, Sing Sing. BKB on, ready to go hard on Fada, doing as much damage as he can. If he can bring him down to stop the exorcism, this will be huge, and down he goes. Now Eternal Envy on the run. Koikba in hot pursuit, Blink Dagger up in three, and has a shockwave here. Also has an RP, but shouldn't need it. We'll be able to just stab him down with the... The old staff there, well, he'll chase him down into an oblivion, and Pycat, or pardon me, Pylai Tai comes in and brings down Sing Sing's Troll Warlord. So a pretty even trade, but it does go the way of Team Tinker, a three for four exchange. Yeah, and another death for Envy at the end of this fight. He's really having a rough time on this Invoker. Six deaths and his team fight involvement has just been kind of minimal. The Necrobook is really nice and paying off, and he's getting Sunstrikes into the Chronosphere, but he's... He's really being dealt with quite nicely by Team Tinker. Yeah. Most of the damage yeah, is coming from like Sand King and, and Death Prophet. These have been the two big heroes. Pilot Eye, that team fight. Bit of a whiff on the on the epicenter. That was a really bad team fight for Cloud9 as far as landing spells goes. First the KOF offering, then the epicenter both off the mark, but they still yeah. traded okay. It wasn't as bad as it could have been. Yeah, it sort of just goes to show you that despite a uh, 10,000, now 12,000 gold deficit, uh, they can still do a lot of damage if their ultimates are on the mark, but that can prove to be a, a pretty big if, as Nature's Prophet already back up to 4,500 gold. He's 10-1-5. and five. Just look at the net worth chart. Pycat is leagues ahead of everyone else. 5,000 up on the Cloud9 leading farmer, and now he'll just go ahead and pick up his Mjolnir for a little bit of extra damage and uh, creep clearing ability. Cloud9, even though they've been trading somewhat evenly, they're just falling further and further behind, and now it's 14,000 gold, 12,000 experience, and if this keeps up, Team Tinker will just eventually surpass them in item progression and uh, continue to out-level them. Koikba, close to his refresher, has the two core pieces, and actually just about there, he'll pick it up right now as he sits in the well, and there you go. That's a huge, potentially game-changing uh, item pickup for Team Tinker. Yeah, Quakefa's already had a very big game on this bag and is getting some really nice RPs. Been using the skewer to great effect as well. Something that uh, some mags don't do as much is going for those blink skewer bags and kind of being like a semi bat rider going for pickoffs using skewer. And uh, there's been a lot of uh, at least attempts and some successful skewers from Quakefa. Yep, EGM on the run. He'll get an observer ward down on the high ground. Radiant put a sentry and they know there's a ward up there and their smoke will get revealed. And this is sort of an awkward spot for them to be in where Tinker are taking the high ground and looking for an opening to initiate, but instead they'll just send their Nature's Prophet up top. Pycat will commence the split pushing, and the rest of Tinker will just uh, position themselves appropriately not to get engaged upon. Koikba and EGM around the backside, ready to commence the wraparound with the double RP available. Sing Sing still holding the high ground. Nine second charge on that BKB, ready to rock and roll in this upcoming fight. Cloud9, no, it's a third Roche coming up, and they want to contest it. He'll respawn right now, and it's actually Cloud9 that move into the pit. Oh, with a double RP on the Magnus. This is risky. They will take vision control. Dire are completely blind right now. Exorcism has been deployed. Roche falling very quickly. And Team Tinker, I think they want to contest this, but they'll go in too late. It's already fallen. Death Prophet, the one to pick up the Aegis. Uh, and a fight breaking out around the backside. It is Pylai Dai who gets initiated on first. Will force staff to the low ground, and now it's EGM that's on the run as he's been pretty isolated. Koikba is in the tree line looking for the big RP, but his Blink Dagger is going to get uh, cancelled here as he does start taking some Ghost damage. They'll lose EGM first, Sing Sing coming around the side, but Ghost Walk will keep the Invoker standing. Top lane, Nature's Prophet is pushing in while they're just biding their time. He forces out the Glyph, and they just want to cancel TP's first RP used on Bone 7. Now, out comes the Malefist, the Skewer, they'll find the kill onto the boy. Epicenter from Pylai Die does some damage, but not enough for any kills, and there's no follow-up. Sunstrike comes through, does clip Bulba and Sing Sing. Again, not enough damage for a kill. Sand King will pay for his life as the rest of Cloud9 forced back to defend the top tier 3 tower, which has already taken half damage. Yeah, and Quakefa uses his refresher, so it looks like they want to just keep on going here. Bulba still has his black hole, so uh, ultimates and are still dagger. online for Team Tinker. They want, they want a tier 3, they want potential racks. Yeah, with the Blink Dagger on the way for Bulba, this black hole could be uh, potentially game ending here if Cloud9 aren't careful. And they will start to channel the upheaval. Eidolon's pressing forward, and the slow 
annoying, but not really enough to keep this tower standing. Meatball flies through from Envy, and still a 5v3 on the field. Buyback status not available on the Void, and the Sand King does not have it either. Well, Team Void's Tinker back alive and has Chronos here, so... Yeah, yeah it's, and, oh, it's, he uh, he's got eggs. Yeah, so that'll be a pretty short cooldown on the Chronosphere. But once more, Team Tinker just furthering their lead, holding steady at 14,000 gold, about 14,000 experience. And they'll just scoot back, clear out the Radiant Ancients, and uh, Team Tinker just finding so much more efficient farm around the map. It seems like every time they take a fight, they make a note to clear out the Radiant Jungle, grab the Ancients if they can, before retreating to their side of the map to commence farming their neutrals. Yeah, Pycat's just been leading the way. His net worth is so far ahead of anyone else's in the game. He is just... I mean, finding kills, finding farm, everywhere he goes, it's just incredible. He's 5, got another 500 5 gold. Yeah. Oh. I mean, what does he go for next year? What's your what's your mm -hmm. dream profit build when you have this kind of farm? Maybe once a BKB to deal with some of the magic damage from a lot of these spells. Uh, oh, it's never too late for a blink dagger, especially against Void, trying to use that to blink out. Uh, otherwise, yep. damage-wise, there's like options like the Daedalus and the, the Desolator for breaking bases, the Necrobook 3, but... I think BKB is the safest, the safest option right now if he wants to be playing it. BKB blink type items, but mm -hmm. yeah, it seems like he's finding a good mix of the split pushing as well as the team fighting here. And uh, that fight, his presence in the top lane is what really put Cloud Nine into shambles, where they felt forced to retreat to keep their base safe. And that's when Team Tinker really pulled the trigger, and Quickville was happy for a solo RP just on the void. And that's when they can really find easy kills when the stragglers are headed back to the base, get left behind. Well, Team Tinker happy to sit back for now. They know Cloud9 will have ultimates online and ready to go, so they don't really want to yes. go try to uh, group up and push into that. Yeah, uh, and also in that last skirmish, they did not burn the Cheese or the Aegis. Uh, Aegis of the Immortal still standing in uh, the DP's inventory, and uh, Eternal Envy is the one to pick up the Hand of Midas. He will go for the Assault Karas following the Necronomicon. Some obvious synergy uh. there with the Death Prophet, uh, who has now yeah. gone for Shivas and Heart of Tarask. I, mean, I think he's kind of realizing, like, look, I'm only offering so much in team fight. let's get some more items. This will, as you said, really complement the Death Prophet and maybe help keep himself alive a, a bit longer against the physical damage from, from the Prophet, from Troll. And, I mean, some of these heroes from Team Tinker aren't going to scale as well as they'd like to the late game. Troll is a carry of sorts, but uh, he's going more kind of tanky builds here. So if you get a, yeah. enough survivability like Envy's kind of starting to do with the Assault Crest, this Troll's damage will kind of wane off. Yeah, it looks like the Troll is definitely going more utility-focused, as you were mentioning, with that point booster. Uh, looks Dyer's like a Scotty buildup. And uh, just a good item on Troll all around. You can throw those axes, slow multiple targets, and... Um, just helps him beef up quite a bit as he is kind of their front liner uh, aside from the Magnus. He, they've been using the Ma Magnus as an initiator, but Dyer's almost more so as kind of a counter initiator attack. once they've already made the retreat and it's Sing Sing that goes charging in in the front lines with his BKB on. Bottom lane, Cloud9 will group up for a tower push and we'll see Fada in the front lines here again with the Aegis in tow. He will be happy to get initiated Dyer's upon relative to his teammates. Fallen. They do secure the tower and up top it's just the Prophet pressuring the tier 3 but doesn't really commit to it, still has not committed to a Blink Dagger, so has to be very careful with his movements. He will go for the BKB, so good call on that one, Parker. Yeah. Despite the 15k lead that Tinker have, it does, it definitely feels a lot closer than that, and I think a lot of these heroes are like, heroes like Prophet where you get this huge amount of farm, but you don't have the impact of like a 21k net worth hero always in a team fight, so... Um, even Magnus, like for me, Team Tinker's lineup, it's much harder to execute, and that's where, despite the fact they have this huge gold lead, all Cloud9 need to do is just stick to their big team fight, get land their spells, which, I mean, in theory, Epicenter, Blink, Barrow Strike should happen in a team fight. So, I, I think Cloud9 still have a good shot at winning this game. Yeah, they're definitely not out of it, and even just the gap between the Nature's Prophet uh, and the other farmers of Cloud9 starting to close as they knock down these outer towers. And here we go, smoke from Team Tinker. They're ready to take the fight as Fada in the front lines. He doesn't have much time left on the Aegis. It'll be going down in about 30 seconds. And there's Sing Sing get initiated upon, but the big RP from Koikba to get it started still has the refresher available. Black Hole from Bulba comes out on three, pops his BKB, will get interrupted straight away by the Golem. 
But Sing Sing falls, buys back, Faceless Boy goes down, Death Prophet to boot, loses the Aegis at about the worst time possible. Now Envy gets converged on, Cloud9 in shambles, Aoi 2000 will survive for a few more seconds with the Shadow Word, but it won't be enough to ensure his survival. And Cloud9 in big trouble. Great buyback from Sing Sing, doesn't hesitate at all. And oh man, yeah. that could have been a totally different fight if the Aegis was still in tow, but oh, expired man. literally seconds before he went down. Yeah. That Aegis timing and blowing up the Death Prophet. Like, Death Prophet's no, no exit in the fight, no chance for Cloud9. And Team Tinker are happy to just throw everything on a Death Prophet. This hold is still possible, as I said, they still have Exorcism. Here come the buybacks. They also still have an Epicenter. Cloud, or pardon me, Pylai Die just needs to survive. The tower will fall. Nature's Prophet first to go down. Bulba on the back foot is uh, Fada doing a lot of damage. Will maybe be able to finish him off. The Ghost just not quite enough. They turn for EGM. They will bring down the Twin Headed Dragon. They hold the base. But it's costly. Tier 3 yeah, tower takes half damage, and it's how many buybacks? Uh, two burned on the Invoker uh, and on the Death Prophet. Yeah, they would have liked to have gotten some more kills, and I feel like they should have. Like, the Enigma there, they could have. Death Prophet didn't fully commit to the chase. Thought maybe the Sunstrike would finish it off, so they didn't fully commit to the chase there, and um, it, the two kills is nice, and Pi Pycat is on the sidelines now with a, a buyback himself, which he probably won't use just for the Tier 2 tower. And I don't see Cloud9 going any further than the tier 2. They haven't got Exorcism, it's a huge risk. Uh, they may actually, do you think it may try and... No, they're not going to go for this. They're going to sit back, RP three seconds away. If they had RP, I think they'd go for it with a profit buyback, but not the case. Yeah, uh, with no Golem and no Exorcism, I can't imagine Cloud9 will really try to press their luck too hard Cloud9 here. Maybe still pushing are? up. <laughs> they're so Maybe. deep on the map here, I, I don't know about this. Yeah, they will just uh, back up now and... Hang around a little while longer, making us just a pinch nervous there, but make it back and will not concede any losses, at least not yet. But Sing Sing moving out of the base. Bone 7 and Pylai die still hanging around. Death Prophet is already TP'd home. Aoi 2000 is nowhere in sight. And, well, Team Tinker will not move into their jungle, but there was a small opportunity there if uh, Cloud9 were a little bit less lucky, perhaps you could say. Roche still a little ways off the mark, but... Team Tinker will definitely want to take uh, this next Roche. So the cheese was also burned in that fight. So all of Cloud9's spoils from third Roche will no longer happen. Yeah. Or no this longer be a very fast right. Roche respawn. So we'll see if Cloud9 can get their hands on it again or... Oh, Team wow. I, yeah, I misread that. I, I That's like one of the fastest respawns possible. I thought it was... Yeah. The, that was the the signal that the RNG portion of the timer hadn't started yet. Oh, okay. yeah, the, the, the flashing. Yeah, it was about 30 seconds past, like, the, the minimum. So, like, an 8-minute, 30-second respawn. And, okay. Yeah. And Team Tinker is scattered out. I don't think Cloud9 are aware just yet. They can use Sunstrike and we'll probably figure it out soon enough. And, hey, they, their actual map control is not existing. Pycat's already in the pit with, tra with Battle Trans. Yeah, and they can just melt this so quickly. Even just Pycat alone, they may try to sneak it without uh, without walking by potential wards, but there's just no ward coverage in general on the map. Dyer have one Observer ward down here outside their secret shop, and that's about it. So this Roche will go down uncontested. Cloud9 won't even make a movement towards it. And uh, who grabs the Aegis and Cheese this time? Sunstrike comes in, almost gets the last hit, but or almost, uh, Jesus, what am I talking about? Does some damage there, but just scouting it out. And, um, okay, it is... Wow, the Pycat is the one to grab the Aegis. Cheese will go yeah. to the, uh, Magnus. Huh. I like the Magnus with Cheese. He has potential mana issues when he has the Refresher Orb as well as RP. Sure, he's got 1,300 mana, but there's Necro books, there's stuff which can kind of disrupt his combo, so... Give him the Cheese, be on the safe side, and make sure he can get off the double RP in the fight, should you need it, and... Yeah. That's for He can sell this Midas and buy a new item if he if he wants to fairly soon. Yeah. I'm just surprised they don't give the Aegis to, uh, to Sing Sing here. He's that frontliner as we've talked about, and he was the first to fall in the last team fight. Yeah. Um, he's kind of meant... I guess he's meant to soak up a lot of damage. Like He's not actually doing that much in right clicks right now. Pycat's kind of more of their carry, and there's a lot more fragile as well, Pycat. But there's definitely arguments for both, and... We'll see how it works out. It looks like Cloud9, once again, despite being up against Aegis and stuff, they're like, hey, we'll go take a fight. They have to make sure Fata does not get picked off to start the fight. He needs to get an Exorcism off, and he needs to stay alive with Exorcism up for as long as possible. Yeah. Sing Sing will deter from the Scotty, though, and now picks up a Plate Mail. They don't have a Shivas up quite yet or an Assault Karas, so either one could be an option. I think the AC is uh, probably a more likely choice for Sing Sing. 
But uh, that will slow down his Scotty timing quite a bit. Now, a Scythe of Vice on Koikva's Magnus. So he has mm. the Refresher on top of that, which means there's potential for a double Hex, which can be very, very uh, potent. Against Void, Death Prophet, that's huge. Because Death Prophet is often in the front lines and uh, a very killable target when you've got these Hexes, multiple Hexes and double RP. Void as well does not have a BKB, so... He tries to Corona. If you're not caught inside it, you can Hex him. There's a lot to lock down this Void. And, oh, the Invis Rune. Oh, connects with an RP on two. In comes Sing Sing with the Whirling Axes. Fada pops the ultimate. In comes the Sandstorm. But it's just not enough to secure any kills. Void will go down first. And now the Black Hole is there. Gets interrupted right away by Aoi. He's on point that time. It'll proc the Aegis on the Nature's Prophet. But Fada gets dropped before the damage can really hurt too much. The Golem gets picked off. The buyback scenario for the Radiant side looking grim. And this could be the game-ending push. Jakiro will buy back yeah. and TPs as forward as he can, even though it's just outside of the base. Upheaval slowing them <laughs> down, but just delaying the inevitable here. Oh, boy. And even Death Prophet has buyback in like 20 seconds, but there's no exorcism. They used it during that five. So this is yeah, really now Aoi bad will get caught. Line. And this, yeah, this is it. Aoi buys back. Glyph comes out. But no outer towers remaining. Tinker should be able to do crippling damage, if not just push for the win with this. Even Void yeah. coming up, he'll have a Chronosphere, but he just doesn't do any damage. He has a Mask of Madness, and that's it. Warlock, no ultimate, same problem, different hero. The, it's Yeah, it seems there's too much reliance on the Death Prophet ultimate. And during the mid-game, they're, they're getting a lot of extra damage out of the Sand King Epicenter, but the later this game goes, the, the less effective that Epicenter is becoming. And well, Team Tinker get the second lane, and with that, well, I don't think they're done. I think they're going for, yeah, they're going for the third lane. They want to secure the game, and it's well, GG. No, there you go. Nothing Cloud9 can do, so a pretty action-packed game, 42 minutes. Can't really say that Cloud9 ever had control of the game, but they put up a good fight through uh, through most of it, and Team Tinker just come out victorious with a series of big ultimates. And I look at Koikva as uh, kind of an MVP there. He played a really strong mag and just had uh, RPs coming left and right, it felt like. Yeah, I, I think Koikva's my MVP is... Uh, as greatest Pycat farmed, and he played a really strong Nature's Prophet. It was uh, the RPs in some of these team fights which really won it for, for Team Tinker. Uh, and obviously the, the Magnus is the more flashy hero in this game, but uh, he came up big with some of those RPs. Even just solo RPs in team fights on heroes like Void before he could Chronosphere. This was a very quiet Void game, and a lot of that came down to Quakeless Mag. Yeah. Well... Team Tinker, they will be victorious over Cloud9 uh, across the board today. So I know that will make Balba happy. I was chatting with him last night. and Good news for them. And uh, looking at the standings here, that puts uh, Team Tinker in a slightly better position and one step closer to making it to the top four out of this Star Ladder Season 10 European group stage. But that's it for our coverage today. Uh, EU goes on break for the next two days. Star Ladder America will pick up, and then uh, EU resumes coming up on Wednesday. So the European teams will have a little break, but plenty more Star Ladder action. China and SEA will also be picking up over the next few days. So, well, we have that to look forward to, gods. Yeah, some, some good games. We're going to mix it up a lot. They've got like all four regions going over the next two or three days. Europe taking a few days off, but... And when we come back in a couple of days, it's like three, four regions all on the, all on the same day. So it's going to be a lot of style other action. So if you guys yeah, haven't that, already, buy your Dota TV tickets. It adds to the prize pool and helps support these teams. Yeah, most definitely. So we're done for the day. Take care, guys, and we'll see you for Starlighter America coming up tomorrow.